How's the mic sound? All right. Okay, awesome. Great. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, this is part of our technology and culture seminar series. There, are, for your reference, there are a couple more this semester, and we hope to continue it next semester as well with a bunch of other speakers. Um, but today we have our very own brand new community member, uh, Dr. Amon Miller. Can I say that? Miller. Right. Miller. And um, he comes to us from a place that you may recognize other faculty at all coming from, which is at MIT. Um, he's from the Media Lab. And in particular, uh, what's interesting is that he worked on a project called Scratch, which is a kind of visual programming language. And it's targeted at kind of younger audiences. So even kind of the K through 12 uh, uh, audience. So it's helping people kind of understand what computing can do for you and what a computer science degree may lead you into, right? Control of computing and control of uh, computer systems. But what uh, Aman is working on is mostly the physical outreach version of those kinds of things. So not just stuck inside the box, but can we get outside the box? So hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that today. So uh, Dr. Alvin Miller. Miller. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on the rainy day. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what you see on the screen all around engineering. So getting outside of the computer box um, and getting inside the computer box, doing both at the same time, uh, it's an effort that I think leads to this idea of making people well-rounded and um, addressing the topic of the seminar, which is uh, integrating technology and culture. So. Hopefully, what I have prepared today will spark your interest because I'll be talking about these four things. Um, the all-around engineering vision, my uh, people that were guiding my thinking in the all-around engineering ideas, I'll explain what that means and who I think were embodying that, uh, uh, embodying the ideas. Talk about my research efforts that led me to Olin and what I plan on doing here with you and your colleagues. So first, I have to give a disclaimer, is that you don't have to be an engineer or an engineering student to be an all-around engineer or embody those ideas or think like an engineering um, student. But if you are studying engineering like a lot of you are here today, then that gives you a good start, which is why I'm talking to you about this. But it's not limited to just engineers. And the first example of an all-around engineering thinker is Leonardo da Vinci. A lot of people can recognize that picture, right? In the the painting, it's familiar to everyone. That was me when I was younger. I'm just kidding. No. Now that's Mona Lisa. That's what he's very well known for. Um, but a lot of other people uh, give him credit for his thinking in other areas. So you can see in uh, to the upper right there, he was also credited for designing uh, flying machines and was thinking like a machinist and creating things to extend humans' capability using technology. And uh, underneath that, this suit of armor is a very interesting uh, project that Leonardo also came up with because he thought it was entertaining, but a lot of people credit it for being an early robotics project because you can see the gears inside there articulated this piece of armor, and people say that parts of it were uh, programmable, like uh, it could interact with people that were guests at the rich parties that um, would have suits of armor in uh, the doorway. So. Um, a lot of people say that this is one of the early examples of robots. And for you guys here today, the next time you see people at a party doing the robot, you know, you know where it came from. This is the first example of that. So I thought I'd let you in on that little secret. Another exemplary all-around engineering thinker is George Washington Carver. And a lot of people mostly associate him for his thinking with uh, what material? Do anybody associate? George Washington Carver with any particular material? Peanuts. Peanuts, right? That's what he's holding in his hand there. But with peanuts, he was able to invent 300 uses uh, for the society that he lived in in the uh, early, um, in the early, or he was in the mid 1800s and the early 1900s. He was thinking of ways to use peanuts to make pavement to make paints. He has a peanut patent for paint. So say that nine times and try not to get your tongue twisted. But he invented uh, all sorts of things using peanuts as well as soybeans, as well as sweet potatoes, and things that he had around him to be very inventive. So it wasn't just improving peanut butter. Um, he was embodying all around engineering 
uh, and I want to use him as a base for the kind of research that I did because his uh, ingenuity guided my thinking as I was doing my research. So I'll use Carver's model to explain a little bit of what all around engineering involves so that I could define the term further so that you guys know what I'm thinking about. Uh, it involves selecting materials that you have available for you. So everyone didn't have a McMaster car or a DigiKey that they could just punch in and everything that they ever needed would show up at their door. Um, so Carver was collecting um, peanuts. Uh, he, there was a depleted South when he was uh, coming of age. Cotton fields were um, stripping the fields and making crops hard to uh, come by, but there were some crops that could survive in the depleted southern farms, and that was peanuts. So he used them to invent all that he could because a lot of the local farmers um, would have that available. So he chose this as his material. That's why you guys know him for that. Uh, and you also see depicted uh, sweet potatoes and soybeans as they led to many of his other products. He was in the Tuskegee Institute, and that gave him a college campus where, as you guys are familiar with, you get a lot of resources. You get laboratory materials. But uh, he had a great microscope that was ahead of his time to be able to examine these materials. However, that shouldn't limit you to um, what you do in your college laboratories. He regularly went out with his students and went to the local junkyard and found glass jars and found what, uh, materials to make all kind of other tools that he needed to invent many different things with peanuts. So you can see here that this is a roller and a grater that allowed him to um, separate the proteins from the oils and the peanuts, but he grabbed these materials from the junkyard. So it wasn't just like, I'm at college, um, let me use the lab that I have and what was provided for me. He extended uh, his lab with all kinds of things that he made himself to make all these inventions. So he was mixing the new school with the old school technologies. And he was doing a lot of making. Over, have, have, to have over 300 peanut-based products, um, he was very prolific. And some people don't know the extent to which these innovations reached. And uh, if you look on your right, my right, uh, your left, there's a, an old Ford car there. So some of the products that he was making in this laboratory with these handmade materials were contributing to synthetic rubber that would be able to go on um, old school tires or soybean based upholsteries and even uh, fuel briquettes that were basically biofuels, an early version of those. And uh, he also designed this wagon that you see here to take the laboratory outside of the Tuskegee Institute and into the neighboring communities. Uh, because he wanted the lab not to just exist on the college campus. He took the ideas that he was doing with his science and with his engineering out to the world around him, which is something that has driven a lot of my work. Um, so engaging others is another important aspect of all-around engineering. The people that he was able to engage with were beyond just the ones that were at his institution. He worked with Booker T. Washington a lot at the Tuskegee Institute, but he also collaborated with Henry Ford and able to, in order to uh, enable the thinking towards um, the synthetic rubber and things that, like the fuels that would help the car industry. So he was able to break some of the racial barriers because uh, he was actually born into slavery. So you could imagine how tough it was at that time for African Americans and white uh, innovators to collaborate. But when you're an all-around engineering thinker and you're producing good ideas, sometimes that breaks down those barriers. So this is a very powerful model of that, um, collaborating with Henry Ford and others. Uh, and when you are doing research, you know, sometimes you, your publications are headed towards academic conferences and journals that people at other academic institutions can read. And that's one great avenue for getting your ideas out to the world and other people that can help extend their reach. But uh, Carver was very, uh, very known for everything that he did, making these bulletins that he would take on that wagon with him to the surrounding community to make sure that the farmers knew how to do the same kind of techniques that he was doing in um, his laboratory for separating peanuts, making 105 food products out of it so that they could sustain themselves and, and empower themselves the same way that he was doing, which was another reason to have everyday materials in the laboratory because when you took that out to the world, a lot of people can do uh, the same sort of science and engineering that he was doing and empower themselves to have a better lives. And he left many great quotes that motivate uh, people. This one is particularly relevant to me in my work, um, as Mark explained, with creating programming languages for young people. 
Uh, so I'll read it to you, that new developments are the products of a creative mind, so we must therefore stimulate and encourage that type of mind in every way possible. So because I wasn't born in the Carver era, the ways that are possible now have a lot to do with computing, and that's why uh, I chose to make that my major and be a computer scientist and um, stimulate young people's uh, and college students alike their minds using those methods. So I'll talk a little bit about my pre-Olin all-around engineering research efforts. And I'll start by giving you a demonstration of scratching the physical connection because that's just the, the best way to get some ideas across by letting you see it hands-on, especially at a hands-on institution like Olin. So uh, as Mark introduced Scratch, it's uh, a visual programming language. So that means you don't have to remember where to put a semicolon when you're typing text-based commands. All of the commands are right here in the interface and there's a palette where ones that relate to how something moves on the screen or how something looks on the screen. So I'll just drag a block from the palette to the scripting area and double click it and you can see that the character on the cat responds, excuse me, the character on the screen responds to that. And I'll put together a script by stacking these together like Legos on the screen and then bringing some of the power of computing which is, let's just use a loop here, and so forever now, this cat will chase his tail until, it, until I get tired of it and press stop. So that's how you make uh, programs in Scratch, but the connection to the physical world is almost that easy. So because the design nature class that I'm helping with this semester, they were dissecting toys today. So I figured I would dissect a toy and bring it back uh, in a different way and extend its power through computing, just to give you an example of connecting the physical world to the digital world. So what I've got here is, can anybody recognize this game? Is it still a classic? It has been for generations. George Washington Carver probably played that game. He probably invented one <laughs> with peanuts, too. So I've got an image of the operation guy. I'll get this get back to normal. All right, Operation Man, now you're in my world. So when I had this when I was younger, uh, you know, I wanted to play all the time, but I didn't have batteries, and you know, so it, was, it would be uh, there teasing me. Uh, so I'm going to get back at it today. You know? I never liked this guy's haircut in the first place, so I'm going to change that by going to the graphic editor in Scratch, and I'll get rid of his hair. He's going to owe me $7 for this after we're done. Quick haircut. And I'll put it back so that he looks somewhat bald. All right, big improvement. So now I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to give him a Ronald McDonald-inspired colorful hairdo. This will be all the rage. I want to see this all over Olin campus next week. You can leave the yellow stripe if you want. It's optional. All right. So now I've got, I'll get rid of the cats. All right, so now I've got two pictures of this operation guy. And I want to play the game my way. I left the batteries at home because I was connecting this uh, operation game, I wired it up to the Scratch sensor board. So this is one of the projects that I developed uh, with some colleagues, Robbie Berg, John Maloney, at the Media Lab during the course of my dissertation to help Scratch connect to the physical world. So this has a couple of built-in sensors. Uh, there's a push button, a light sensor so that you can see how much light is uh, reaching the board, a microphone, a uh, sliding potentiometer, and you can add your own sensors. So I'm going to turn operation into a sensor here. So I'm operating on operation. Get that through your head. So I've got this wired in so that we can write a program that as I remove the purple hair from this guy, which is just made out of some yarn, then it will also remove itself on the computer screen. So I'll show you how to make a quick program that connects just an on-off switch to the, the language. So first I'll make sure that everything is connected correctly. 
All right. So I'm talking to the sensor board. It's giving me a value. And I've got one of these alligator clips plugged into operation in jack A. So I'm going to ask that every time I'm looking forever, and every time A is connected, the switch is closed, then I want it to look like purple hair operation. And every time it's not, I want it to look like the other graphic that I have in there. So let's double click this and see if it works. So right now, it should look like purple hair on the screen. And when I remove the purple hair, then it removes itself on the screen. So you can see that there's a connection. Get back on there. Hello. Between the physical world and the virtual world. So this is one way to extend the kind of, um, you know, they give me one set of instructions to play with the operation game. But with the power of computing, I can make it go all kind of different ways. And um, I've always wanted to do this. This poor guy looks like he's freezing in this auditorium. So I'm going to give him a blanket. So the piece of foam core, I'm going to cover him up. So I'm just going to stick this on the sensor board. And we'll give him a sheet on the screen. So I'll open up a new character here. I'll just draw my version of a hospital sheet. I know, it's beautiful. Oh. Not a dirty sheet. All right, and now we'll control this by, um, I'll put a forever loop here, and I'll change the Y coordinate of this blanket based on how much I'm sliding the sensor. So I will set the Y value to the value of the slider on the sensor board. So you can see that as I move this up and down, I guess I'm not really covering as much of him as I'd like, but you get the picture. He's still going to be cold, but. So these are just some fun ways to start connecting the physical and the virtual, and then I'll um, explain why that was important as we go on through the talk. So what you just saw was um, the work of a lot of the colleagues that I had in the Lifelong Kindergarten Research Group, led by Mitchell Resnick. Uh, we developed the Scratch programming environment and uh, the Scratch sensor board to enable those kind of connections. But uh, like you are doing here at Olin in some of the classes, you're, I went, we went through an iterative design process on this sensor board before it got out to the world. Now um, the Playful Invention Company has uh, commercialized it. It's open hardware, so there's more than 5,000 of them that have got onto the world so far. But it started out with a couple of pieces of plastic and some explorations that um, were an iterative design process so that we can know what kind of product we wanted to make. So um, we don't just, when we're talking to you in the classes, we're not just telling you to do it for an exercise. It's very important to uh, try things out um, in your lab, test it out with people, and keep iterating until you get the ideas right. So this is just showing some of the early examples of a much smaller version that didn't have any built-in sensors. These are some um, puzzle pieces that let people break apart the sensor board and use it in different ways and only add the sensors that they wanted to add. And from playing around with these two versions, there's also a couple of others up here, we were able to build in um, the kind of sensors that we wanted to put on the final product and how many extra sensors we wanted to let people have because you don't want to inundate people with too many, but you don't want to give them too few to do anything cool with. So that's um, my take or one of my experiences going through the design process that you guys also go through with your uh, curriculum starting with design nature here. So um, beyond designing the technological tools, there's also a lot that goes into making sure that people can use them when they get out into the world. So I'm going to describe the hookup system and all the elements that went into it. Because it wasn't just tools, it was also creating activities around the tools that you create that resonate with the, the intended audience. So 
uh, my audience was uh, young people in informal learning environments, after school centers, museums, community technology centers. Um, they had access to uh, paper plates, foil, foam core, things like you yarn, things like you saw me playing with with these examples. And they could use those to connect with uh, sensors. You may have gotten a dial out of some old electronics, or you can make your own sensors um, using paper clips um, to judge uh, the temperature, the humidity in the room, the amount of tilt that something is doing, uh, the rotation. And when you connect those materials with those sensors, uh, you can control computer programs in Scratch. So that was the process. You had to think of a lot of different ways to connect people with these materials. And uh, you had to think about activities that would uh, get people um, playing with the physical and the virtual world. So I just used one example of an old board game, but there are many activities that came along with that work. So to tell you a little bit about how this enabled all around engineering and the ideas there that I spoke about with Carver, um, the next couple of slides will discuss um, how selecting materials helps people recognize the richness of the world around them. Uh, mixing the materials together um, helps people have good uses for merging cutting edge tools and classic tools like Carver's Lab did. Uh, when you have these materials at your disposal, you can make interesting products and use them in unexpected ways. And you can also engage others, not just uh, introducing colleagues, but everyday people to the powerful ideas that come from all around engineering. So a few example projects that uh, I just give glimpses to, and if you want me to talk more in the Q&A section, uh, I can. But um, one of the materials that I had available as a resident advisor in a frat house at MIT for four years, I had a lot of pizza boxes available to me. Surprise, surprise. So that became my material of choice for building things. So some of the ideas that I played with, you can see this uh, previously used Domino's pizza box uh, has turned into a skee-ball arcade. So when you can connect with the power of computing, you don't just have to play skee-ball, which is you roll a ball into a cup and it gives you 10 points or 20 points. This example was, because it was in a pizza box, why not roll a ball into the cup and have it change the toppings on the pizza on the screen? So you get the ball into the sauce cup, then you get more sauce on the pizza. You get into the toppings, you get more pepperoni. So this was um, a mixture of having fun with the materials around me and using computation to make interesting interactions. Um, and I didn't have any peanuts at, at the frat house, so I had to use the pizza box. So a potato inspired um, a project that I did with some of the young people in the learning centers that I visited uh, after uh, in after school centers. So has anybody played the game Hot Potato? You know what the game Hot Potato is? If I threw this out into the crowd, you guys would be able to? All right, ready? Okay, no. I don't want to put your eyes out. But this is a hot potato that involved the scratch sensor board. So with a brown paper bag, someone made the sensor board look like a potato, but poked a hole through it so that the light sensor was exposed. Because when it's, a potato's in your hand, it's pretty dark. So it can tell if it's dark or if it's light. So this is an example of um, the young people that I worked with going through an iterative design process because they thought that it wasn't free enough to be able to throw around something that was tethered. So they iterated this design and tethered themselves, their hands, to the four ports that come out of the sensor board so they could free up the potato. So they made a foil ball, excuse me, a foil wrap potato, and they could throw it around any way they wanted to when it wasn't tethered. They could bounce it off the wall, bounce it off of Debbie's head, whatever uh, came to mind. And uh, when they caught it, it was, uh, they had foil on their index finger and their thumb so that it could complete a circuit and tell the computer that who was holding the potato. And the computer in the back here had a scratch program running. Can you see that? Yeah. That would do different things based on whoever's hand the potato was in. So everybody had their individual uh, graphics. So the programming that it took to understand when the, ball was, when the potato was in the air versus when it was in someone's hand was a lot of conditional statements. If it's not in hand A, if it's not in hand B, if it's not in hand C, if it's not in hand D, it must be in the air. So them playing with those ideas in uh, computing was frustrating and fun at the same time. So when they got it to work, the main uh, programmer leaned back and was like, I'm a genius, figured it out. So these are great uh, moments for young people to be able to play with the concepts that we get to play with uh, here day in and day out, but captured in a, a fun way. Uh, so cutting edge and classic tools, another example of that was working with young people that uh, had a conference room space 
where you walk in and there's usually a coat rack so that you could take off your coat and get to work. And they were working on things like this. So they ignored what I had on the table prepared for them and they brought the coat rack in. So this classic material of hangers became the base for this project. So what you see here is labeled high jump because they took a hanger and stretched it across the coat hanger rack. And because the hanger and the rack are both metal, it connected to the sensor board, you can tell when someone jumped over and kicked the hanger off, then um, if they didn't kick the hanger off, then the Scratch program would give you a happy animation, and this would wave his arm and say, and cheer you on. But if you kicked the hanger off, they could sense that and give you a different animation. And I was like, okay, we're sad. Athlete, you need to come back and jump higher next time. So that is um, another way in which you can use the computing, uh, the cutting edge tools with some of the classic things around you and leverage the world around you to create interesting things. Uh, another example of that came in the, in the form of a chair. So wood, um, people can cut wood with a hand router, just turn, plug it in and turn on a drill. You can cut out all kinds of things in wood. But when you have access to computer control, you can design files um, in uh, a program like CorelDRAW or what have you, and you can design the route that that router should take. So these young people cut this chair but they didn't just make any chair. They wanted to integrate an idea that they had from too much violence happening that summer around them. There were 86 homicides that summer, and they were tired of it, so they just didn't cut any chair. They cut a tombstone shape, and they used a laser cutter, the computer-controlled laser, to cut that reflective plastic in the middle that says, rest in peace. And they uh, brought people into it by lighting it up with the electronics that they learned uh, that summer. So they have this chair that says rest in peace and it's glowing and it attracts you to it and you see yourself in the mirror. And then if you sit in the chair, they had it connected so that you would hear a gunshot when you sat down and then it would tell a story of some of the people that passed away that summer. So they were connecting um, old school technology with new school technology, the wood and the router with the computer control to uh, make these new inventions that were very relevant to them. Another example of exploring the materials in unexpected ways, when you have uh, programs that have people uh, exploring these ideas, you don't expect some of the maybe 16-year-old teen males to come in with uh, the stuffed animals they used to play with when they were younger. But that happened for whatever reason, and they were able to uh, surgically insert the scratch sensor board into the stuffed bears there. And by doing so, they were able to record their voices on the computer and make sensors in the extremities of the bear so that when you squeeze the paw or squeeze the stomach or the toes, it would say different things. So um, they dressed up the bears in different ways and their voice recordings were pretty hilarious. You can see uh, the guy on your right trying hard not to laugh as he's presenting these, but there were um, two bears that were telling young kids that would presumably be paying with them to stay in school, except one of them was talking like a teacher that has a nice bow tie, uh, that's proper bear on your left, and the other bear was um, speaking like a, a street thug, which would tell you to stay in school in, in, a, in another language, which that was very funny uh, to the presenter. So it let them explore um, these kind of conversations that don't come up all the time. You don't get through teenagers um, designing things for younger people to engage them in, like, why are people dropping out of school? Let's get that dialogue going. But when you empower people to have um, these tools, then anything can happen. And, and Working with graduate students in one of the courses at MIT, they used a bike that they no longer, uh, sorry, it's a little dark, but that's a bike frame that's on the table. They were able, no longer able to ride that bike to work because it didn't work, but they could use it in a project to tell a story about commuting uh, in uh, Cambridge. So they rigged the bike pedals so that every time you rotated the bike pedals, the sensor would pick it up and the biker on the screen who's in here, would start going faster, and all the cars that were driving by would go after the biker. So the only way that you could protect yourself, yeah, that's a true story that happens in Cambridge, those of you that live there know. So um, the only way to protect yourself was to ring the bell that they had that was also connected to the sensor board. So if you rang the bell, then that would get the cars away from you for maybe three minutes, and then you repeat that process. So you able to give old, um, an old bike new life by connecting it to the computational world. So. Um, Another way that this work got out into the world was similar to how Carver took 
his lab and a wagon to the community surrounding uh, Tuskegee, uh, I was able to work with uh, an organization called the Fab Lab from uh, MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. And one of the ways which those ideas got out to the world were through the mobile Fab Lab. So in the basement where I worked, just like there are machine shops here in the academic center, there is a laser cutter for you guys to use. There's a lot of um, woodworking machines and there's a lot of computer controlled machines. Uh, we also had that in the basement, but we shoved it all into a race car um, trailer. So what they normally put NASCARs in and drag behind the truck, we got rid of the NASCAR and put in all these machines so that we can take it around to different neighborhoods um, from DC to Chicago to uh, Burning Man and uh, everywhere in between. So this was one way to get the ideas out of the institute and have c people come in and use the computers that are in there to um, print things from keychains to we made um, very big bubble uh, bubble wands that people have made on the large machine. So just getting people thinking about creating things that were personally meaningful in this kind of place was one of the fun adventures. But that wasn't the end of the story because you shouldn't just um, ride through a neighborhood and then take the fun stuff with you when you leave. When Carver was giving out the pamphlets and giving out seeds, the people that had their land um, next to them, they were able to uh, be able to plant their own materials and use the crops that grew the way that he wanted them to with the bulletin. So they had access to their fields. It didn't just go away when the wagon left. So um, these fab labs are actually places that are meant to stick and become a part of the landscape of the community. So uh, a lot of work went into creating the spaces with which these kind of tools could be used. And a fab lab was the same idea of taking a selection of the best of in the machine shops and places like MIT and Olin and putting them into community centers where they have people that would come by and make use of them in their own ways. And what was depicted in this picture is um, there's a lot of activity, but this was prior to uh, young people making jewelry with the laser cutter using some neon plastics and cutting little butterflies and dragonflies and making them into jewelry and taking that out around the corner and having not a bake sale, but a fabricated jewelry sale. And to come back with a couple hundred dollars from that is a very powerful experience to be able to design on the computer, get it out into the world, and also create uh, some economic incentive to um, study these type of things and make this a part of your daily routine. So uh, that is one avenue through which I was able to get uh, some of the work out into the world. And now there's over 40, there's over 40 fab labs in 10 different countries. Um, and doing, getting that idea scaled out to different communities came from a lot of my work with computer clubhouses, which are another <coughs> technology center that uh, came out of the thinking of the MIT Media Lab uh, with some, some of my former advisors, colleagues, wanted to give young people a place that was kind of like a museum where they could get their hands on science and these type of tools, but um, the museums have admission costs, and so uh, people can't do that every day in low-income communities. So the computer clubhouse was targeted for low-income communities to give them 15, 16 computers. And a lot of the software that you receive here at Olin when you show up on your laptop, professional design software, the Adobe suite is already there. That's what the young people walk into in these centers, is that Adobe donates their uh, full suite for them to be able to become graphic designers, to be able to be web designers. So a day in the computer clubhouse can have to do with computing and craft. Um, like you see here, that's an electronic birthday cake where you blow out the candles and a digitized song will play. Um, but there's also other things like a recording studio. So a person can record a song, come out and make the CD cover for it, um, put a website up, and then try to get a show uh, all in the clubhouse in the afternoon using the professional software. So these were ways, oh, and there's over uh, 100 computer clubhouses in 22 countries now. So these are avenues through which um, when you design technologies, uh, sometimes you have to design the spaces in which they'll be used because um, they may not be uh, welcomed into a school environment right away, but there's a rich space in the after school environment uh, where people can explore and get their hands on um, these kind of technologies. So. Another motivator for my work was this book called Unlocking the Clubhouse, um, because the computer clubhouses were there to give people access to the kind of ideas that will enable them to be all around engineers when they uh, grow up. But um, 
as some of you may be aware, uh, Olin is a special case in having close to a 50% male-female ratio at an engineering school. Um, books like Unlocking the Clubhouse, Women in Computing uh, by Jane Margolis document some of the hurdles and barriers for entry for all people into fields like computing. So this is one of the things that we keep in mind um, when designing technology because you want everybody to, you don't want anybody to have, uh, to be locked out of this kind of fun <laughs> environment that you enjoy being all around engineers. So a couple of guiding principles have gone into the work that led up to Scratch and beyond. So uh, Seymour Papert, who was a visionary uh, and helped create the logo language that was the predecessor to the Scratch that I showed you, but ha he had a guiding principle that's called low floors and high ceilings. So low floors are that the barrier for entry should be a low threshold. People should be able to come in and make a computer program just as fast as I showed you in the demonstration so that there's not a barrier for entry like I missed the parenthesis of the semicolon. So that was a very important principle for some of the tools, um, which is making it powerful but approachable. And the high ceilings part is that you can do what you would do in a college course um, or what you could do with a professional tool. So the high ceilings was that uh, the languages, they were modeled after the actual languages that you could use in industry, like um, Logo was a subset of Lisp, which was a powerful language. And the way that people were introduced to that back then, there's a robot on the ground here that the young ladies are around. And that robot was a way of getting people into programming by telling uh, the robot to move 10 steps along the floor. That was programming it, say. You know, I want you to make um, a house, so I want you to move 10 steps forward. So you could walk that out, and then you could go back to the computer and tell the robot how to do that, and then say, I want you to turn, and then walk a few more steps. So connecting the physical world to the programming languages has been part of the um, thinking since early on, and part of enabling low floors and high ceilings. Um, and the examples that you see on the screen are creating these shapes with, um, this is a version of that turtle robot that's on the screen. So you have something that's on the screen that you can tell it to turn right, go straight, uh, go a few more steps. And you could draw these powerful, um, use programs to make these geometric shapes and understand a little bit about programming, understand a little bit about robotics in some cases, understand a little bit about geometry, all which are powerful ideas. And uh, to extend that guiding principle in more recent work, uh, my uh, advisor, Mitch Resnick, uh, built, worked from the principle low floors and wide walls. Uh, going into the uh, math-like or the programming avenues aren't the only outlets coming from using these computational tools. So as you can see with this butterfly, this is incorporating more of the arts and the crafts because, uh, yes, it was a very mechanical challenge to have the wings on this butterfly flap at the same time to gear it up so that you write a program that ran a motor and it would control the butterfly so to have one motor controlling two wings. But there's also a lot to do with the aesthetic there and just making it so that if you like working with pipe cleaners and crafts, that's your entree into doing this activity is to having something that is not just bare Lego or bare metal, but you can beautify it. That's an entry point into programming. So the wide walls metaphor is that you don't have to just be doing math activities or programming activities. You can also go in arts and um, a lot of different avenues should be um, in the space. And I want to extend that last principle even one more step to go to low floors and no doors. And what I mean by no doors is that there should be um, no one locked out of the clubhouse, um, to use that metaphor. And um, so you, we have to continue making these tools that have low barriers for entry, but don't uh, say that, oh, you're um, you know, you are in the arts, so you shouldn't be doing robotics. You're into this, like, there shouldn't be any doors between that. So um, that idea is one of the things that I want to move forward while I'm here, especially at Olin, because there are a few disciplinary doors between taking classes here. Uh, there's just, like, uh, a space that has few departmental hurdles that says, well, you're a computer scientist, so you can't take um, this course in electrical or this course in uh, information technology, which was partly uh, part of my experience in undergrad, but there were things that were out of my reach just because of my disciplinary affiliation. So um, taking down the doors and is one of the things that I want to do and 
there is a tool that's on the horizon that's enabling young people to do even more kind of projects in the uh, trajectory that I was showing. This is a robo garden, and um, mod kit is the toolkit that's coming up that lets you use scratch programming like blocks and connect with the Arduino platform that has not just the ability to take in sensing into the computer like I was demonstrating earlier, but also take some of the power of driving motors and turning on lights. Um, and using that in this robo garden example, there is a young person that had interest in not tending to a garden um, the old-fashioned way where you have to check it yourself all the time and feel like uh, you're letting it die if you're not there. You can use a humidity sensor in the soil to see if my plant is getting too dry. I can use, uh, I can actuate this pump that's in the bucket of water and just have that water my a miniature robo garden for me. So this is using, um, not having the hurdle of uh, programming in the way, using uh, the scratch-like programming blocks, connecting it to the physical world to connect to gardening as a, an interest of this young person is something that um, will open up the door and hopefully give him an opportunity uh, to pursue all-around engineering, should he so choose. So the term um, all-around engineering does have engineering in it, but I want to drive home that it doesn't just mean connecting with other engineers or other disciplines within engineering. Uh, Paul Graham wrote a book called Hackers and Painters um, because when he was going through computer science, he felt that you know, he didn't have fruitful conversations sometimes with the people that were heavy into the mathematics of the computer science or into making algorithms or engineering software systems through specification. He was very interested in making things, kind of in the spirit of the projects that I was showing, getting, um, making things that were beautiful. And he enjoyed talking to painters just as much as he enjoyed uh, talking, or more so than he enjoyed talking to people in his field. So he laboriously connected the process of making beautiful art and programming. And so hackers is uh, the term he used for computer programmers that just like to make things, makers. And painters, they're more similar uh, than they're dissimilar. And that goes a little bit back to um, da Vinci when he was known for his art, but he was also a person that made machines. So um, I'm wondering if anyone in the crowd knows of other people who are noted for their artistic prowess as well as being a good hacker or maker. Does anybody know painters that also broke off into that world? I'll give you a hint. This is my painting of a Pac-Man being chased by a flaming ghost. So as you can tell, I didn't grow up to be a, a Leonardo-esque painter. This is in my father's office. So you know, I'm not, I can do great things with pizza boxes, but I'm not the best painter out there. So it's not me. But if you uh, are following the theme of this talk, you might guess that the all-around engineer George Washington Carver uh, was a great inventor, but he was also a painter. So uh, having conversations with people that are outside of the engineering disciplines is very helpful as well. So I think that is encapsulated in the all-around engineering ideas. So at Olin, you have great opportunities to do this. The innovative curriculum um, takes you through classes that have you designing, have you learned about mechanical design, uh, engineering, and, and working with embedded systems. You can also take arts and humanities courses um, without a lot of disciplinary barriers. The scope teams that you do as seniors put you in teams of multiple uh, backgrounds and disciplines. And now there's even more effort going into the tri-college collaboration with um, actually Brandeis as well with uh, Wellesley and Babson. So um, there's a lot of potential for all around engineering going on at Olin as we speak. But I want to add to that and contribute. Uh, the course that I'm offering in the spring is called Computing and Craft. And I wanted to be able to help some of the all-around engineering ideas flourish here at Olin by taking people through a process that I explained earlier. So in one of the projects in the class, you can identify uh, people that you want to work with. They could be people, they could be young people, they could be your peers, they can be elderly. Um, in a, they can share your interest or you can try to design for someone who doesn't um, enjoy the things that you do. But you'll be selecting and playing with different materials throughout the course of the course exploring different types of sensing and control, and 
uh, your first project will, um, you, can, you have the option to use some of the existing tools like I showed you with Scratch and the sensor board. But uh, the group project that, in t that follows, you'll be doing a similar process. But by the time you get to project two, the course will have taken you through a lot of other toolkits that do similar things in connecting um, the physical world and the virtual world in different ways using different graphical and text-based languages. So I have a few examples up here. There's some that are from Lego, the playful invention company. Um, here's the Lego's newest um, toolkit, the WeDo. And there's also the option to make your own toolkits or extend um, ones that already exist. So the mod kit uh, toolkit that I mentioned in earlier slides, that is something that you'll be able to use for the second project to create um, either interesting applications that can come into the wearables computing space, can come into the gaming space, the art space, anything of your interest, or you can um, use the tools to extend um, the mod kit itself and come up with an interesting way to add to its functionality. For example, if, it, uh, if you're not satisfied with the stepper motors, you can add uh, gear down DC motors, or if you're not satisfied with the way that the language is handling a particular application or domain, then feel free to um, try to play with extending that. So it's a very experimental course that will give you an opportunity to be at the ground level of one of the toolkits that's in the family of the ones that I've presented that's being developed um, by uh, one of the people that's here today, uh, Ed Boffy, one of my longtime collaborators, and uh, a few others. So that will be part of the course coming up in the spring. So if you have questions about my talk or the course, feel free to fire away. Uh, there, are, there are a great many challenges, and one of them is mm, keeping the core vision in mind. So the set of primitives that you give people to build in a language, it doesn't have to be all-inclusive of every other language. So when it started, uh, there were things that were left out like um, recursion and uh, lists and things like that because um, you have to see what will get the most bang for your buck without confusing young people. So if there are too many blocks, like if there was yet another category, it, it was trying to stay balanced without, giving, without overwhelming people. So get as much of the computing power in there without taking that extra step in, making it so that, okay, I'm in this space, there's too many things, there's lists, there's too many, there's make your own functions. So we had to keep a lot of things that may have been very powerful or useful on the cutting room floor initially just to make sure that the simplicity could get there. So picking that set of things that made it into the first release was very um, difficult decisions in the trade-offs and also having an answer to a lot of people that think, why can't you make your own blocks? That should be in there. Um, you know. So you ha having to justify that answer, um, not just from you, but having young people work with the early versions, like the beta versions of the software, as well as have, um, with the, have the adoption sort of speak for itself. It's like, well, we are trying to hit a sweet spot here. If a lot of people that are in the demographic that we wanted to reach aren't complaining about it, then that's the justification, not all the r reasons that we were in the design meeting. Um, went through about why we think that may be the way to go. Um, and then over time, there were ways to incorporate things like lists and, um, and string variables. And so like when you could take some time to think about it over time, and there is a demand for it. Um, for example, young people wanted like um, Mad Libs and games like that where you can ask somebody like, what's your name? I want to put a high score at the end of my game. So you can't do a high score without a name if you don't have text variable. So over time, you have to think about those things, but it has to come from that direction as opposed to the colleagues. Like, this isn't a real language if you don't include that. You know, it's like, well, we know it covers a lot of the ground that um, powerful languages do, and that um, we want to do so in a way that would be received well so that um, people could play around with it without being inundated so that they actually got the medicine, if you know what I mean, as opposed to being over overwhelmed. What part of was the whole uh, concept of integration with like, the physical world, the few sensor boards and you know, Arduinos and stuff, uh, to people learning about programming, right, just everything happening on the screen? Um, 
Um, so in learning a programming, a, there's a lot of social aspects of learning. And sometimes the one-to-one -one computer ratio won't get you in the door with uh, a group of, say, young people after school when they want to hang out with their friends. You, you have to keep in mind that you know, they were told to you know, be away from your friends for a long time in the after school space. People may want to socialize a little bit more. And um, so having people one to a computer sometimes didn't feel like the right thing to do. And the physical uh, elements could bring people around a table getting their hands on things or having one person work on one aspect of a program, uh, the, the controller, and one person working on the virtual part that was to be controlled. That enabled more of the um, collaboration. It's kind of like the hot potato. There were four people around that throwing a potato around while programming as opposed to four different people on different machines tuned into that. So I think ha adding the physical elements helped with the uh, social motivations uh, to get into programming. And there, the engaging aspects of doing something like Hot Potato, like the game itself is very engaging. So in order to pique someone's interest in programming, it wasn't a matter of creating an elaborate program, something very simple, which is like, when I have it, I, you know, there's only a few lines of code that lets you show that switch to this view that I'm holding the potato. So a little bit of code can go a long way when augmented with the physical world. So it got people to get some results um, or that made them happy uh, and get them more into uh, getting a taste later. But when you sometimes set out for an all on-screen activity, the time to something satisfactory, like I want to make uh, a Mario game, that's going to be a long ways away. So I think it helped get people a, a good taste. Um, and some of the concepts like with switches, like if this is happening or if it's not, is very easy to see in the physical world, like if the hair was on here or if it's not. Um, as opposed to trying to debug that in um, the on-screen world. They're like, okay. So I think it offered a lot um, in those aspects. Um, have you ever had enough time to see like, how um, like, people started off on Scratch, like where they're progressing to like, other programming languages and things like that? Or is this still a little too early to, in a sense of like, how they react to like, more you know, professional computer so the, um, the main idea of giving people the right set of primitives is to get the thinking there. So not necessarily the mechanics of any particular language that will be universal for all other languages that they'll encounter. But similar to an undergraduate education, you, know, you may learn how to think like a programmer in one particular flavor. but after you leave, you can apply it however you see fit. So Scratch is similar, where it's not trying to be the application that you'll use, the hammer you'll use to knock out all nails. But if it's a way that you can come away with some of the core ideas, like what is a variable? How do I make it work? Um, what is uh, iteration and uh, looping uh, conditional statements? I think that it's a great way to get those ideas. Um, and then people can recognize them if they go to Python and other things. What is interesting, like where we do have eyes, is the Scratch website. There's a website for projects in Scratch that you can upload to you know, share this project online. So there's a, a website that collects um, the Scratch projects. And um, some young people that were Scratchers uh, have contributed to um, their own versions of online communities that aggregate Scratch programs. So naturally, we know that they've had to make the jump from Scratch to things like Cake PHP and other um, areas where the kind of programming concepts would come in handy. So those are things that we can see because you know um, we don't have eyes everywhere that people are using Scratch. And that's a blessing and a curse that has got that much uh, attention. But we can't really know where everybody's going with it. But um, the, our main point is that you have the ideas that you can take with you anywhere, but it wasn't set up to be, you jump right into Java. Um, and it wraps us up. I think you'll have other opportunities to ask Amon questions later. 
Um, I am totally registering for your course. I can register for courses, right? Please, please. So, um, I'd like you to, to join me in thanking Yvonne for his talk.